Tony Shu, co-founder, CEO of DoorDash. Thanks for sitting down for Fort Knox. And, Thanks for uh, having me. I, I got some, I ordered DoorDash for some chips and guac. So That's feel free. That's awesome. If you, if you like, I figure. Where did you order from? Um, let's see, the place, let me open up DoorDash. And I had never ordered from this place before. Oh, Al Horno Lean Mexican Kitchen. Okay, I gotta check that one out. Yeah, I forgot to order salsa separately, I guess. Mm. I got a burrito. But no salsa, so rookie mistake. <laughs> um, you're in New York. Yes. And whenever big uh, startup CEOs that have raised hundreds of millions of dollars come to New York, you gotta ask, you gearing up for an IPO? Well, the plan for DoorDash has never really changed, you know, with any financing. It really has always been about. Uh, building on the mission we laid out four years ago, which is to become the last mile logistics platform for every city. Financing events, whether it's in the public or private markets, uh, they are steps along the way, um, but this you know, recent financing uh, doesn't really change much for us. Tell me about the latest financing, because it's a lot of money and what you're gonna do with it. We just raised our Series D financing from three large investors, SoftBank, Sequoia Capital, and GIC. And the goal of the financing, uh, which was a, a fairly significant um, investment, is really to accelerate growth. Uh, first, it's really to add to the selection of restaurants that we have. So you named a restaurant that I haven't checked out before. We have over 100,000 stores on DoorDash, and so there are many more that I have yet to discover. We want to keep adding to that. Today, we serve 90% of the top 100 restaurants that offer delivery, but there are a lot more um, businesses out there that we want to serve, as well as adding to the businesses we currently do serve. Second, we want to grow our geography. So you'll see DoorDash triple its footprint in 2018. Triple in 2018. From 600 to over 1,600 cities. Wow, in across, one year. Across the US, yes, uh, and Canada. So we've got a lot of work ahead of us. And the final thing is to invest in DoorDash Drive, which is the product that allows any merchant to offer their own delivery through their own website, their own phone system, their own app. It really is a platform product that allows DoorDash to serve a restaurant or any merchant, whether it's in retail or any other vertical. I just sat down with Rajiv Misra from SoftBank in Barcelona at Mobile World Congress and talked to him a little bit about the Vision Fund's philosophy. And I take it you're a Vision Fund investment? Or we, no? We're an investment from the SoftBank Group. From, so, from the SoftBank Group, okay. So um, Vision Fund perhaps a, a bit different, but he talked about disruption and scale and taking advantage of inefficiencies as a big part of what that part of SoftBank is looking at. You don't see yourself, it sounds like, as a food delivery company. We don't. We started the company really to help local businesses. And delivery is the first service that we're offering these merchants. And, and speaking of inefficiencies, there are quite a lot in the delivery world. First of all, uh, only 5% of restaurant takeout sales are even online today. 95% of the time, people are still placing a phone call or visiting a store in person. And so the first thing we're doing is providing the, te the technology to bring these local businesses into the digital economy. Mm. And the second thing we're doing is we're helping these uh, restaurants meet customers where they are. And you know, today, in every city, any zip code, people are getting only busier. And as a result, they're looking for convenient solutions to any commodity that they're dealing with or that they purchase. And so for a service like DoorDash, we're also offering the logistics to these merchants so that they can meet customers where they are. I want to go back to paloaltodelivery.com. Okay. When you guys first got started, like, what did you think you were making and how big did you think it could be? So we started, we, we started the, uh, the project for DoorDash uh, in, in, in your referencing in paloaltodelivery.com. We built that project in 45 minutes and launched on a Saturday um, on campus at Stanford. And the goal back then was, was actually a, a very small <laughs> example, but, but the vision was always the same, which was to h build a company to serve uh, businesses and to help them uh, you know, grow beyond their four walls and, and, and to do it in a way that matched where uh, consumers' expectations as well as te technological trends um, were happening. And there were three of you, right? Uh, there were four, four of us when we started, four. yes. Do you need four people? to launch Palo Alto Delivery. Why were the four of you working together on this? 
the founding team met because of that passion for local businesses. I, I didn't necessarily want to become an entrepreneur. Were you in class together? What was? We, we were friends on campus at yeah. Stanford First. Um, we met in uh, several classes, uh, but PaloAltoDelivery.com was started off of one of those classes. Which one? Uh, it was a class called Startup Garage. And you were, what, undergrad, business school? Uh, so two of us were at the business school, and two of us um, were, uh, as they call it, across the street um, mm -hmm. studying computer science. How, how did you end up there for business school? What was it that you wanted to learn? What was your passion that you were looking to expand? I've always made my decisions in life, whether it's you know in work or my personal life, really based on having the most fun and having the least regret. And for me, business school was much less about necessarily the classroom education, um, but much more about the personal growth I was hoping to, to, to gain, as well as um, the classmates that I would meet. And it, it turned out that you know, some of those classmates um, happened to become my co-founders. You went in, uh, you had been at McKinsey? Right? Uh, I started my career at McKinsey, yes. And what about that experience kind of led you down the path to entrepreneurship? I don't know if McKinsey necessarily led me to becoming a startup entrepreneur, but... Some but people have told me, I did consulting for a while, knew that I didn't want to keep doing <laughs> that, and so I decided to be an entrepreneur. Not at all. That, okay. that, that's not the insinuation. I had a fantastic time at McKinsey. I, uh, it really was my first uh, business education. I, um, as an undergrad, I, was, I studied math, and I was primarily interested in cancer research. So mm -hmm. I thought I was actually going to complete an MD-PhD. McKinsey kind of became this 180 for me in which I, you know, Joined my uh, joined the world of business and started my career, um, really learning the ins and outs of all things business, and so it really helped form a very structured way of learning how to think about business problems. What had led you down the path of thinking you were going to work on cancer research? I was fascinated by the uh, just just the intersection of math and biology, and. Um, Numbers uh, ha have come more naturally to me than than other subjects, and and s uh, but I've always found that uh, you know math um, uh, or even applied math in of itself didn't necessarily have uh, the impact that it could unless it was applied towards something that um, you know could really change the world. And uh, I was fascinated by some of the work that was happening at the University of Toronto at the time, in in which um, their oncology team had uh, this was in the early and mid 2000s and, and, and so uh, using uh, mathematical models or computer science and applying it to the world of biology was actually very very early um, in its uh, days and, and, and so that was super exciting to me and um, the potential it could have on patients lives was unbelievable. You grew up in Champaign, Illinois. I did. What I grew was that up, like? Uh, growing up in Champaign, uh, it, it, it's a small town feel. And you know, I, I, my, my family emigrated here uh, from China when I was five. I, I think in some ways it, it, was, um, it, it was the best that, it, you know, um, uh, um, that I could have asked for because it really was a very insulated town uh, of you know, 30,000 people at the time. And, and there was a big university. And so I, I could you know, get my hands on Apple computers to you know the latest in aeronautical you know engineering, which is what my dad you know studied and later taught at the university, um, and also it gave me the, uh, just you know the chance to to be a kid, and w which uh, I, I found to be you know more difficult these days in, in different parts of the U.S. You're a curious kid, though. You taught yourself English. I did. I taught myself English. How, did, how do you do that? Uh, so there wasn't ESL in, in, in the elementary school that I, that I okay, went to. No specified English as a second language track. That's right. No, that that's right. That's right. And so, um, I, and I grew up, you know, f fairly, uh, fairly poor. And so, we, uh, my family didn't necessarily have the means to, to, to get me a tutor uh, to, to learn English. But uh, I learned English by doing two things. I, I, uh, I played a lot of basketball, and that was one way I learned English. And the other way was actually just by watching TV, <laughs> and uh, that's how I came up with my name. So, you know, I watched a lot of Tony Danza, Who's, Who's the, the Boss, boss? growing mm. up. And when I found out that nobody could pronounce my name, uh, which, is? which is Xu Xing in Chinese, um, uh, fairly difficult for a lot of my classmates to pronounce at the time, um, I went with my dad to the immigration office to, to change my name to Tony. <laughs> huh. Did your parents take uh, names in English also? or no? they, uh, My mom did. My dad did not. Um, my my in-laws 
originally from South Korea, immigrated here, and so there's okay. Whole, yeah, so you know what it's about. I do. Um, tell me about that transition that your parents made from China to here, because your your mom was practicing Eastern medicine, right, in yes. China, and came here, and initially, at least she didn't have the capital or the market to continue doing that. She had to do something else. That's right. So uh, I was born to classic immigrants. Um, and you know my family moved to this country with $300 or, or less in our bank account. My dad was getting his PhD at the University of Illinois and working full time as a waiter. And my mom, to support the family, worked multiple jobs. But she was really working multiple jobs, one of which, which was in a restaurant, um, so that she could save up enough money to uh, afford the medical education to get back her license. Because she had effectively lost her license moving from China, where she was a doctor in Eastern medicine. But when she immigrated to the US, and that license was no longer recognized. And so she was saving up money in the various jobs, both to you know, put food on the table and support the family, but also to never give up on her dream. And you know, after about 12 years, uh, to uh, go back to practicing medicine. And so she later on, you know, after 12 years of saving money, was able to uh, you know, have enough capital to actually open her medical clinic. And that's the one she still runs today. What are some of the jobs that she did? She, my, my mom uh, worked at, uh, for, as a waitress um, at, at a restaurant, um, babysitting, uh, and um, a lot of odd, odd and jobs in between. And you helped her out at the restaurant? I helped her out at the restaurant where she progressed from a waitress to a, to a store manager and then later on as a part-time owner. Uh, I didn't do any of the glamorous stuff. I, I, I wasn't uh, maybe- Is there uh, glamorous uh, stuff? Uh, <laughs> fair point. Uh, <laughs> But I, I'll put it this way, I wasn't old enough to, to, to work in the front of the house, so uh, I washed dishes you know, and uh, bus tables. Did you know your mom's plan all along? Because at part of this point where she's working her way back to her dream, you were pretty young, I don't know if she was sharing that. Did you know where all this was headed? I, I didn't know all of the details at the time, uh, but it, it, it really is a remarkable story you know, and, and inspiration for me, um, you know, looking back on it. Um, uh, I found out about it later when I was in high school, and, and that's when she you know, f first made the move to actually taking the risk and becoming an entrepreneur herself and opening up her medical clinic. Uh, that's when I actually discovered uh, the full story. And she worked into being a part owner and then traded in her equity stake uh, for startup capital for her business. That's exactly right. And that's right around the time when you were, what, getting ready to go to college? Yeah, that's exactly right. So I, I was, um, uh, my family moved from the Midwest to, to, to the Bay Area when I was uh, in, the, in the middle of high school. Hmm. And uh, uh, my dad uh, is a, also a very curious person. <laughs> and somehow, you know, he, he um, got bored in the world of aeronautical engineering, you know, building, robot, uh, building rockets and designing the engines in these rockets somehow wasn't enough for him. And so he decided to see what the world in Silicon Valley looked like. And this was in the late 90s. And so there's a lot of opportunity. I think yeah. you went to the, uh, you, you were in the Valley at that time. Yeah, 1999. Yeah. Uh, I, I first made my way to Silicon Valley from Kentucky, also from okay. the Midwest. Yeah, I've been working there at a paper. So. There you go. Yeah, it was definitely a land of opportunity for a few more years. At yeah. Least. <laughs> yeah, so my dad didn't know about what was to come either. However, uh, you know, he um, you know, applied some of what he had done in aeronautical engineering into the world of designing uh, very small chips uh, at Intel. Uh -huh. And so that, that's ultimately how my family moved to the West Coast. Uh, and that's ultimately you know, when my mom decided to you know, sell her stake in the restaurant and take that capital to open up her medical clinic. 